you know, today um, I'll, be, I'll be concluding the, the, this uh, message called Entitled Deeply Rooted, A Not-So-Good Follower of Jesus. That's what we entitled it. Um, and we'll be talking today about being a uh, fruitful tree. That's our topic today. Uh, we did this process where in the first week we spoke about becoming having that perfect seed inside of us. That perfect seed was Jesus Christ, amen? Um, God is the word of, God is the seed. God is the word of, the word of God is the seed, and that's the seed that we need inside of us. When we say yes to Jesus, that seed was in us. And then once we accepted Jesus, now we, want, uh, we need to allow the Holy Spirit to till our ground, to, to, to turn it, to nurture it, to get it prepared so we can receive this seed, right? So then in our third week, we talked about having those roots that are deeply rooted in him, that are a fibrous foundation, so we could stay a hold. So when troubles come, we will not be able to lose our faith, our hope, because just like David was saying in Psalm 86, we know where our trust is. We know where our hope is. So nothing that comes our way, even life, regular life issues, we're going to stand firm in our faith, amen? So we have that perfect seed. We have the right soil. Our fibrous root system is grounded in Christ. And now these three key steps are extremely important so we would start producing the right fruit for Jesus, amen? That's the goal of a deeply rooted lifestyle. And that's what we want to speak to you about today is creating that strong foundation where we could produce the right fruit. Amen? So let me start this message by asking you a question. What type of fruit are you producing right now? Think about that for a while. And in all honesty, sometimes we really don't know until we're squeezed. Right? Now, don't go squeezing somebody right now to find out what kind of fruit they have. But... Sometimes when troubles come, when we face difficulties, do we react the right way? That's what we're talking about. We want to create that fruit that is praising the Lord, that is rooted in the word, that, and we don't react in a different way, a worldly way, right? Because sometimes if we are not producing the right fruit, when troubles come, we may not react the right way. That's why I say sometimes you don't know until you're squeezed. You may think you're okay and, and, and just like I shared a couple weeks ago, then I was watching these two guys racing down the road, and here I am trying to follow them. And I'm going, whoa, 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 I need to slow down. I'm, going, I'm being just as crazy as they are. Sometimes it just happens naturally. That's why I entitled it a not-so-good follower of Jesus, because sometimes we have to react, right? We, we hope that we're in the Word, that we're listening to the Holy Spirit, so when something goes a different way, we react the right way, or we don't take as long as we should. We don't take a week, two weeks, three weeks, a month, a year, two years. It's just instantly say, you know, Lord, I need to get back into your Word. Don't let my mind wander. Bring me back, you know. Yeah. That's what we're talking about, having that right fruit, creating the right fruit, so when trouble comes, we know how to act. We know what to do in the right, at the right time. We have to allow the Holy Spirit to produce that fruit, that love, that joy, that peace, that gentleness, the kindness, the self-control in our life. Amen? So, how do we become this fruitful tree? And being a fruitful tree should be a lifestyle when we are living for Christ. And I've always heard people say that, that people don't know or don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. You ever heard someone say that? Because sometimes people are saying, you know, I don't care how much you know. But once I know that you care, there's, there's a different level of respect that comes with that. And sometimes we have to show them by our actions. Sometimes we don't have to say anything. Just like I shared with the little kid when he says, I just sat in that old man's lap and began to cry with him. I just allowed him to cry, and I was just there as a body to listen. Because words sometimes mess us up, and sometimes we just have to just be quiet. So sometimes people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. We should be a living example to the world so believers and non-believers can see Christ by the fruit we are producing. Amen? Especially when we're squeezed. You know, and even trees, they, it says that, that trees 
have roots and at the scent of water, even they go out and try to go out far and deep to look for water when it's needed. If trees are doing that, then so much so, so we should be doing that more because suffering can drive us to our dependence in God for our life. So we have to be like a tree that it just stretches its roots out and it goes deep to find the source if we are not rooted in him, amen? We have to do everything we can so we can have the right nutrients to produce the right fruit. And let me start by quoting Job 14. Look at what it says. Even a tree has more hope. Can you catch that? He says, even a tree has more hope. If it's cut down, it will sprout again and grow new branches. Though its roots have grown old in earth and its stump decays, at the scent of water, it will bud and sprout again like a new seedling. See, Job, Job is telling us that a tree has more hope to live than us if we are not living for God. Job said at least a tree can recognize the scent of water. Yet we miss the opportunities sometimes to produce good fruit. And he's saying that a tree has more hope than us. Even a tree scent, he could scent, it could smell the water. So it stretches out its roots and it goes deep to try to find that water source. It's saying that we, that a tree has more hope than us. And then if you want to continue that scripture and you read later on in, in your own time, if you drop down to verse 14, it says that, that even, even Job was saying that when he asked God a question, when he said, can the dead live again? Job was saying, I have hope in God. And he asked God the question, can the dead live again? Now think about this. See, we know the answer to that. Because we know that God sent Jesus Christ on earth, and on the third day, he rose again from the dead when he was crucified, right? So we know that the dead can live, live again. See, Job didn't know that at that point. When he's saying, I have hope in my God. And he's asking, can the dead live again? Even if not, I'm, I'm going to continue to trust in you, have hope in you, that you are going to take care of me no matter what the situation. And we all know that he suffered a lot. He went through struggles. His family got killed. He lost everything. But then yet God restored him, and he never lost his hope. Amen? And he's saying, even a tree has more hope than us. But then he's saying, but then I have hope. And he asked God that question, can the dead live again? And he was willing to place all his faith and his hope in God. Job had the right seed, the right soil. He was deeply rooted and he was producing good fruit. And when troubles came, he was not shaken. Amen. That's what it means to be a deeply rooted Christian. Devastation hit his life. He lost everything. But he remained deeply rooted. You know, how can an old seed that is dormant for a long time, for a long period of time, how could it be possible for it to sprout again at the scent of water with the right soil? And I was, and I put that in Google, and I was just researching. I say, you know, how old can a seed be? How old can it be before it dies or it doesn't produce? And I kind of read that they found three seeds in 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 Israel, and uh, and and they and they say they were saying that they were 2,000 years old because they found them when they, you know, how they do carbon dating. I don't know how they do all that, and um, they went deep into the ground and they found it in this archaeological archaeological site, and then this this guy decided to plant them. And one sprout out, and it was a palm tree, and it was, and it was producing dates. 2,000-year-old seed producing date. You know, sometimes for certain people, it takes a long time to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So what am I saying? Is that it doesn't matter if you're young or you're old. Man, if you put your hope in Jesus, you're going to sprout. Amen? The Holy Spirit can begin to move in you. You know, and sometimes when things get tough, that's when we really learn how to pray. You know, and maybe this is the reason why God allows people to reach rock bottom. But sometimes when we, when we look at it from the other side, we say, man, wouldn't it be much easier if you just accepted Jesus and you just decided to give your life to him? Why go through all that struggle? But sometimes people have to get there in order for them to realize where their source is, amen, where their life source is. 
We just have to do our part. And just like David said, we need to be patient and continue to pray. That's all we can do is pray and allow the Holy Spirit to begin to work their ground in their heart so then that seed that is planted in them will grow. Amen? And it will be on fire for Jesus. Even Jeremiah said that the na- told the nation of Israel that God said that he, called, he once called them a thriving nation. That they were like a tri- like an olive tree that was beautiful to see, producing great fruit. But then their sinful st- style and ways of living that led them into captivity again. But God used to say that about the nation of Israel, and, he, and he's saying that about us today. But when you look at the world today, are we a thriving nation right now? Are we a world of chaos? It seems like it sometimes. But once again, we have to put our hope in God alone, amen? We know where our source is. So we need to continue to stay faithful and stay committed and continue to work on our relationship so we can have this fruitful tree and produce the right fruit, amen? So when troubles come, we will stand firm in our foundation. You know, there was a story that my, that my wife shared with me, and, uh, and it's a love story, and it's, in, and it's entitled The Story of a Slave Wife's Love. And we've been talking about love also this past three weeks because everything is rooted in love. Amen? This deeply rooted lifestyle, it's, the foundation is love because God is love. Amen? And, and I want to read you this story because it, it's perfectly and it's fitting to what I'm speaking to today. But I want you to read the whole story. I want you to under, listen to this whole story. And it says, there was this wife that was married to her husband for 20 years. She thought she had married her true love. But over, 20, but over the 20 years, she was, but over the 20 years to her husband, it was nothing about love but power, control, and physical and verbal abuse. This wife's husband demanded her wife to, completely, to complete a daily chore list and wait on him hand and foot. And with love, at the beginning, the wife did just that. For over 20 years, she cleaned, she cooked, she took the beatings, the cheatings with other women and still continued to love her husband. Even when the church and their friends were telling her that she could biblically leave him and should leave him before he kills her. Day after day, she hurried to finish her chores because her love eventually turned into resentment and and fear of what her husband would do if her list were not done. But this faithful wife continued to pray, and in the process, she lost several friends because of her situation. But one day, her husband of 20 years passed away. The wife did not know what to do. As she had sadness, yet a great gladness in her heart because she knew she would no longer have to suffer that abuse. Years passed, and this wife married again, but this time she married a God-fearing man. And everything she ever wanted from the first marriage, she had in her second marriage. One day she was cleaning out the house, and as she was getting ready to move, she noticed an old chore list from her husband that had that was left behind. And as she started to read it, she was becoming very angry because she hated everything she had to do for her ex-husband. Yet she could not, yet she could never be good enough. And then she began to feel guilty. Then she realized that everything that was in that chore list she, she, that she had to do, she was already doing for her new husband and far more because she was doing it out of love. So what's the point? When we are living a life for God and we learn to love him unconditionally like he does us, all the chores in life don't matter because it is easy to do something when you're in love. Amen? And you could take that story in two different ways, but I just want us to focus on God's love for us. Sometimes we may feel that it's a chore. Sometimes we may feel, man, Lord, this is a struggle. Why do I have to keep going through this? Why is this trouble come? I am trying to serve you the right way. And then we start making all these excuses. And he's saying, man, I love you, man. I just want you to have the best. But sometimes you have to focus. You have, you have, we have to work on this relationship. We have to stay committed. God called us to have this agape love. And I've always said we need to love God, love people. Amen. It goes hand in hand. Look at Hosea 
10, 12, it says, I said, plant the good seed of righteousness and you will have a harvest, a field of love. Plow up the hard ground of your heart for now is the time to seek the Lord that, you, that he may come and shower righteousness upon you. See, Israel had sown the seed of sin and they would soon reap judgment. That's what Hosea was telling them. Soon they're going to reach, reap a judgment but then he's saying, but if you would just sow righteousness, you will reap in mercy on your next harvest. See, that can only happen when we have a merciful, loving God. He's saying you are sowing seeds of sin, but if you just turn away from that and just start sowing seeds of righteousness, I will give you a merciful harvest. I will take care of you. I will protect you. You just have to change your ways. See, we all sow or plant in our life, but do we plant seeds of righteousness? What harvest will grow up from the seeds that you have planted today? What harvest is growing from the seeds that you planted this week, this month, this past year? Are you, are you reaping, are you harvesting righteousness? Are you harvesting plants of righteousness that you know or is it full of sin? Sometimes it's our own choosing of what we harvest. Sometimes we, don't, we know the truth, we know what's right, and we still continue to do certain things that we shouldn't be doing. That's just, that's why we have to check ourselves constantly, daily. This human heart is deceitful. Look at Matthew 21, 19. And it's, this is Jesus speaking. And he says, and he noticed a fig tree besides the road. He went over to see if there was any figs, but there were only leaves. Then he said to it, may you never bear fruit again. And immediately the fig tree withered up. See, in this passage, Jesus was showing anger towards, uh, towards religion as it was only being used for show. In the temple and the Pharisees were only using it for show. And he was saying that, it's, that from a distance, it looked impressive. It looked glorious. It looked great because the Pharisees were just standing in the corners with their robe, and they were just praying his prayers out loud that everyone would hear, and they were just saying, look at me. This is what it looks like to be sinless, free of sin, perfect, because I'm God's chosen people. But then what does Jesus say? But, at the, but when, you cl when you get close to it, when you come close to it, and you start examining it, you would realize that it was hollow with no fruit. It was just a show. And he was giving us the example from a fig tree, from a distance. It should have had good fruit. But when he got close to it, there was nothing. And it was barren. It was hollow. If we only appear to have faith without putting it to work in our life, we are like this fig tree that withered and died. See, genuine faith means bearing fruit for God's kingdom. So faith without works is dead, amen? So what are the reasons that we might not be producing this good fruit? What are the reasons that is keeping us from producing this good fruit? When we, sometimes it's because we want religion instead of a relationship. Sometimes we get stuck in religion, and we have to be careful with that. Because it's a, it's a relationship. That's why, once again, going back to just like me, like Pete says, I am a not so good follower of Jesus Christ. When someone asks me, who, what are you? Are you a Christian? I go, mm, I, don't know what, I don't know what your definition of a Christian is. I'm just a not so good follower of Jesus. But because they think that being a Christian, it's, it's in getting involved in this religion that you can't do certain things and you have to walk a certain way and act a certain way. And because it doesn't fit their lifestyle. Sometimes we are seeking the religion instead of a relationship. When we want full control of our life, sometimes we don't produce the good fruit because we're not allowing the Holy Spirit to move through us. We want, we're tell, telling the Holy Spirit, we're telling God, no, I know how to do this, I got this. But when I need you, I'll just call you. But let me, let me do my own thing. We have to be careful. When we want to worship our possessions, when we think that what we have is more valuable and we want to hoard it in, we don't want to help out where we need it, when we're saying, no, I earned that because I did that, not because God has blessed me with it. Amen? And when we want to turn away from Jesus, sometimes we don't produce good fruit because we turn our backs on Jesus and we only go to him when we're in trouble. We only call out to him 
when we're in trouble. But when everything is going fine in our own, in our own thinking, in our own life, we kind of forget about them. All four reasons is what we call self-righteousness. And that's one of the biggest sins of all. You know, we know that the devil was kicked out of heaven because he wanted to be like God. But you know what? No, he wanted to be better than God, right? Because he was self-righteous. Why do you think he hates us? He doesn't like us because we were created in his image. We were created in the image of God, and, and the devil doesn't like us. So what, what's the best way to do to try to get at him is to try to destroy what he created. Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden because they wanted to know all. And they ate from the forbidden tree of good and evil in their own sinful desires. All the, the serpent really didn't do it. He, he just tempted. And he allowed us to make that choice to take of that fruit. Because, and I believe that God was wanted us to, he told us not to because he wanted us to give us his knowledge, a sinless knowledge of good, amen? Not take it for ourselves and us create in our head what good and evil is. He wanted to give us the perfect knowledge. Jesus Christ is the true Messiah, the perfect king. And when Jesus comes to this earth and died on the cross for our sins, we became righteous through him. By being obedient and surrendering ourselves to him, how much more should we be producing good fruit for him? Amen. Look at Galatians 5.22. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. And I want you to notice the singular for the word, it says fruit, not fruits. It says fruit, one fruit. With seven distinctive, distinctive features, right? Characteristics. It's one fruit with seven different characteristics. And there was a pastor called uh, Donald Gray Barnhouse. And he was a great preacher, pioneer. He was uh, this great theologian, radio announcer, writer. And he pointed out when I was reading that love is essential to the fruit of the Spirit. Because when I looked at this passage of Scripture, I always thought that it was love and self-control, and everything else was the feeling. But as long as you had love and self-control, you'd be okay. But he was saying, no, no, no. He was saying, he goes, love is essential to the fruit of the Spirit. Everything evolves around love. And now, you know, I couldn't agree anymore because love is the key. Because love is is God, I mean, because God is love, right? God is love. Love is not God. God is love. The Bible tells us three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. Love being the greatest, amen? It says, he says that joy is, a, is love singing, to make a joyful noise unto the Lord, to bring your worship and your praise to him. It, t it tells us that in the book of Psalms, in, in Psalms 100, it says that peace is love resting. Peace is love resting. Psalms 23, I let you rest in green meadows. When you are having the right relationship with the Lord, he, he is the only one that can bring you true peace. Patience is love enduring through trials. God will always sustain us. Kindness is love's touch. Kindness brings healing to our soul. When someone is kind to you, it just brings this peacefulness inside of you. Amen. When you have that right relationship with him, it just gives you that rest and that strength to continue to carry on. It says that goodness is love's character. People will know you by your fruits, once again, especially when you're squeezed. Faithfulness is love's habit. Gentleness is love's self-control, self-forgetfulness. And self-control is love holding the reins. Be slow to speak and quick to listen. That's the reason why I believe God gave us two ears and one mouth. <laughs> we need to be slow to speak and quick to listen. Sometimes we want to give someone the answer before they even ask the question. And that always gets us in trouble. There is no fruit of the Spirit without love. Because once again, God is love. The gift from the Holy Spirit living you the love of the holy spirit is in you amen so what type of fruit are you producing right now is your are you is your tree full of good fruit 
Proverbs 11.30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. That's just powerful. Look at Matthew 24. Now let's take a lesson from the fig tree. When its branches bud and its leaves begin to sprout, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see all these things, you can know his return is very near, right at the door. See, Matthew was saying when a fig tree buds, there is an expected result. And it's saying the summer is near and fruit is coming. As a church, we need to be ready. We need to cling to Jesus and live a genuine faith that produces good fruit. We're, we need to be like this fig tree that's, that we know that our Savior is coming. We know that we are going to produce good fruit. We just have to be obedient and trust in him and be deeply rooted and continue to work in the relationship. So when everything is all said and done, we will stand tall. Amen. Next to him. And Jesus gave us that perfect example on how to do just that. And that it's in the Great Commission. And we all know this passage of scripture. And Jesus told his disciples, he told them, I have been giving all authority in heaven and on earth. He tells them, I've been giving all authority. So he tells us to what? To go. To go. And that's a given. It's that, that means that we need to get off our chairs. We need to get off our seats. We need to continue. We need to do something. We need to take that step of faith and say, Holy Spirit, I am trusting you. Whatever you put in me, whatever desire is in me, I am ready and I'm being obedient. And I want to go and do it for you. Amen. He says, go and make disciples of all nations. That's the second one. He says to make disciples. That's the first command that he gave the Jews and us to go and make disciples. That's why Pete is telling us that we, when we got involved in this Thrive program, he was saying that we need to, we are not a follower of Christ until we make a follower of Christ. We need to continue to share God's word. We need to continue to live the example that Jesus gave us to go to make disciples. And then we baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And nothing gave me more, more great joy than what then I had the personal privilege, me and Pete, we were in the pool, and we were able to baptize our grandkids together. Man, that's a grandfather that gave me great joy. I look forward to that, and it was a huge blessing to be able to baptize my grandkids. And more are coming, I hope, one of these days. We, need more. <laughs> we want more grandkids, but we, we can't get no more. I think we're, I think we're stuck. I think we're stuck with three. Uh, but, you know, we're planting that seed. Maybe one will come. But then once we baptize, what do we do? What's the fourth part of that great commission that we need to teach? Amen. We need to teach the word of God. How do we teach the word of God? By reading his word, by studying his word, so we can speak his word. Amen. We can only teach someone what we know if we have a relationship with the person that we're trying to learn from. And we're trying to duplicate that so we can share the same message. Amen. We need to go make disciples, baptize them, teach the Great Commission. That was Jesus' example. See, in the book of John, and it's not in my scriptures, and at, towards, the end of the chap, towards the end of the book of John, it, we have this scene where John is tell, he's getting ready to go. I think it's John chapter 20. And, and he's telling his disciples, he brings them in, and he's telling them about that it's time. And then he does something amazing. He breathes on them the Holy Spirit. If you look in John, it is yeah, chapter 20, he says, and Jesus breathed on them the Holy Spirit. Jesus breathed on them the Holy Spirit. That, to me, it's a covering. It, it was, it was, he was commissioning, he was saying, okay, you are officially called to do the ministry. You need to go. If the Holy Spirit was going to be, was on them. And then we know that in the book of Acts, in chapter 2, then the Holy Spirit was in them. Amen. Two different things, which I was looking, when I look at that, I'm going, man, that's amazing that Jesus breathed on them, the Holy Spirit, just like God breathed on us, when, in, you know, breathed on humanity and created us. Now Jesus is saying, I am sending you. And then in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit was in them and is in, in us as well. That is a deeply rooted lifestyle. Amen. Here, let me close with this. 
Jesus offered his righteousness for our sins, something of immeasurable value for no value. We can't be idle. We can't ride the fence of life. When, you, when we realize how much has been given for us, amen. We cannot be a lukewarm people. We know what the book of Revelation says to the church that was lukewarm, that he was spitted out. We have a fertile soil. We have the right foundation. Round foundation. Our roots are deeply rooted in Christ Jesus. God gave, God gave us that firm foundation. So church, it's time to grow. Amen. It's time to grow. And the only way we can grow and produce good fruit is to stay connected to the vine. Amen. We need to be deeply rooted in Jesus. So it's time to grow, church. Let me share something personal with you before I close. And this is, and I'm humble when I say this, um, and please, you know, hear my heart. But this message that I've been preaching to you for these past four weeks, you know, God gave me a vision about a year ago to write a book. And I am not the, I don't like writing. I dislike writing. Uh, so I was like going, Lord, are you sure? And, and I don't like reading. And I'm going, Lord, are you sure? And I don't have the best ways of saying words or how to make it all flowery and pretty and perfect and do this and do that. But God gave me this desire. And in, by faith, I trusted. And I just put pen to paper and I just began to write. And then I create I, this book that I self-published, created, illustrated. I did everything. I printed it out. And then the a Spanish church approached me and they said, hey, you know, I like that book, but can you make it in Spanish? And I'm going, man, I go, that's another whammy because I don't speak Spanish that great, even though I was born in Mexico, which is sad. Um, <laughs> and and I, I speak, it, it's easy to speak Spanish because you just don't, if you have the accent, you just got it. You know, tacos, taco. I mean, it's, you say it the right way. But, but I mean, but saying the right words, to, in, translating Christian words to Spanish in a certain, it's just a little bit different. It, when you say something, you have to turn it around and say it the opposite way, and then sometimes it loses its meaning, so you have to find the right words to say. But then the Lord gave, just gave me the, the patience to just be obedient, and I wrote it in Spanish. And now we're getting ready to, and I sent this book to the Philippines, and, we're, and, and Pastor Dana is in the process of translating in Tangalo, in Filipino. You know what I mean? Oh, you, you don't have to clap. It's all good. Man. But... But, it's, it's, but it's, it all started from being obedient and saying, Lord, I am trusting you. And if one person could re reads that book and he gets closer to, and finds Jesus, then it's all God's, to God all the glory. Amen? Amen. That's what it's about. We are called to do something. Sometimes it might, we might struggle with it. Sometimes we might not understand it. But we have to be obedient. If God is giving you that desire in your heart and you're supposed to produce that fruit, then that's the fruit that you need to produce. And then, and then allow God to move in you. And then the Holy Spirit will change who he needs to change. Amen. We just have to be obedient and answer the call. It all started with a simple book. And now if you type my name, Tino Liziola, in, in Amazon, the books will come up and you can buy it. Please go ahead and buy one. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> threw that, I had to throw that one in there. And, but, but you know what I mean? Or you, you can, if, you, if you don't like using Amazon, you can drive to the Christian bookstore. They have them there as well. They have a, they have a section that says, you know, you know uh, pastors in the area, the road books, and I'm, I'm there. Um, but... All I am saying is that we just have to, by faith, trust in what God puts in our heart. If it's, a, if it's a desire to write, when people ask me, well, how do you start? Just start writing. You might not even know the topic. You might not even know what you're saying or what you're going to write about, but just start writing. And then eventually it will turn into something, right? But we have to begin, and the hardest thing is just to start. But once you start, you know, 80,000 words later, then you go, man, I didn't think I had that much to say about a tree. <laughs> but, we were being, but we're being obedient, right? We're trusting in God. So be deeply rooted in Jesus. Starts with love, creating a perfect relationship. Amen. With every